Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be discussing a fair charging future. Um, my name is Noel Coyle. I'm a costing and risk analyst um, working in third party cost forecasting. I'm joined today by my colleague, Grant Barr. Grant, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Good afternoon, Grant Barr, Technical Solutions, uh, here to support customers in navigating through this journey over 30 years experience in the industry. So hopefully following this today, Niall will be able to help explain and we'll be able to help you find a path through this. Brilliant. Thanks, Grant. So just a quick look through the agenda before we start. So we're going to give a first a bit of a background on what are electricity network charges. We'll discuss one of the problems that Ofgem have with the current network charging. I'll then give a bit more detail about Ofgem's targeted charging review and changes that are coming up on Horizon. Uh, then Grant will take us through some customer examples about what the TCR means for you and your business. Um, and then wrap up with a bit of what you can do about it um, going forward. So to get started then, just to give a bit of an overview about the um, costs that we forecast within Aon. So of the industry costs we forecast, we split them into three main categories. So we have the network charges. Uh, these are the costs that cover the transportation of energy from the generators all the way to customers' homes and businesses. We then have what we call the policy costs, which tend to be uh, green subsidies for renewable generation. And then finally, there are system costs. So these costs pay for the second to second balancing of the uh, of the electricity system and maintain security supply. So the focus today are on electricity network charges. So as I said, these recover the cost of transporting energy from the large generators all the way to customers, homes and businesses. So these networks are owned by transmission and distribution network operators. Um, so it's split into two main categories. You have the transmission network, which is the highest voltage network. Um, so this is operated in Scotland by Scottish Hydro Electricity Transmission and Scottish Power. And in England, Wales, it is owned and operated by National Grid Electricity Transmission. So this uh, large transmission network transport the energy from the generators to the um, local distribution networks. So these distribution networks are the um, low voltage end of the network. Um, and these transport the electricity on the, the final uh, miles to the to your homes and businesses. So these are operated by a number of different companies, um, but you'll see on the screen um, who these networks and regions are operated by. So how are electricity network charges calculated? So all network operators in the energy sector have their revenues set via price controls, um, and these price controls are set by Ofgem. The price control model used in the electricity sector is known as the Rio model, where a company's revenue um, that they're allowed to collect is determined by a package of incentives, innovation, and set outputs um, that have to be achieved. So these price controls get reviewed every five to eight years. So for the transmission price controls, um, this is now moved to five-year cycles, so beginning in April 2021. So this Rio model essentially determines the revenue that the networks are allowed to are allowed to earn. So once this revenue is known, the networks uh, then need to recover it through their tariffs. So this is when we start talking about the tariff charging methodology, which is also approved by Ofgem. So this is what dictates how that revenue is collected from their customers. So we move on to the problem um, caused by network charging arrangements at the minute. So as we say, we have this pot of money determined by the Rio price controls that the network is allowed to earn. If you have uh, some large customers who load manage, this could be the via on-site generation or demand side response. Um, and effectively, at the minute, the main uh, source of this is via triad avoidance. So these users can avoid um, the triads and therefore not pay any transmission charges or very little transmission charges. Um, so this reduces the amount they contribute towards this pot of revenue. So what this means is that other users of the network who can't load manage and 
therefore can't avoid the trial periods. They actually see their charges increase um, because the, at the end of the day, we have to make sure that the networks recover the right amount of money. So if customers are avoiding charges, it means those charges get put onto users who can't avoid the charges, um, which Offgem um, see as being unfair. So this is when we come on to the Offgem's targeted charging review. So what is the TCR? Um, it's an Offgem led review that is seeking to reform the residual part of network charges. Um, they're also looking at some of the remaining embedded benefits as well. Um, but the main purpose of this review is to reduce any distortions um, that exist in the network charging methodologies um, and to make sure that the charges that are produced by them are fair and proportionate to how users uh, use the system. I've been concerned that network charges are being avoided by these large consumers. Uh, so this is primarily via having on-site generation or some demand-side response. Um, so I often believe that by these users doing this, they benefit disproportionately by avoiding these network charges. And this forces other users of the network to essentially pay more um, than their fair share towards these charges. So Ofgem's solution to this problem is to make the residual part of the charge unavoidable from April 2022. So to give a bit more background to how the charges will change because of the TCR. So for Chios at the minute, so that's the transmission part of the charge. Um, before the TCR charges are implemented, 100% of the charge is based on uh, the triad volumes of a customer, or if a site is non half hourly settled, it'll be based on their evening share of demand. So the entirety of the charge will depend on, on those two things. However, when we move to the TCR world, when it's brought in in April 2022, there'll be a small amount of the charge that remains as the triad slash evening peak charge. So that's around 10% around nationally um, is the share of revenue where 90% of the charge is now going to be recovered by, by these fixed charges. So the fixed charges are going to be split into various bands, uh, but I'll come on to that uh, on the next slide. So for the distribution side, so for Duos, currently um, charges are recovered via a time of use uh, consumption charge. Then there's also some small fixed charges and capacity charges that are along with that. So when the TCR is implemented in April 2022, we'll see the time of use charges reducing, um, but we'll see the fixed charges increasing and being split into the four bands as they are for Chinos. So all these changes are going to come in in April 2022. Um, and the next slide, I'll take you through a bit more detail about the bands in question. So the fixed charges um, that a site will be allocated um, on the right-hand side here, you'll see a table of all the charging bands that are created as a result of the TCR. So you'll see for domestic, there is a single band, so every domestic consumer will pay the same fixed charge. For the non-domestic side of the market, um, customers will be allocated to a, a number of charging bands. So how are these sites going to be allocated to the bands? So this, the band that you're allocated to will be, depend on your voltage level. And if you're non half hourly settled on your net annual consumption, whereas for half hourly users, you will be put into bands based on your agreed capacity um, as determined by your connection agreement. So to determine the net annual consumption or capacity level um, that has been used to allocate sites to bands, um, the network operators have used an average of 24 months of data so consumption data are about 24 months or capacity data are about the same period um, to determine the net annual consumption or capacity used for this allocation. Um, probably worth highlighting that the boundaries that you see on these bands um, have been determined, to, determined for um, each of the voltage segments to be based on the 40th, 70th and 85th percentile. So that's where the, the actual barriers between those bands are set. So when we say um, you'll have a fixed charge per site, a site is now defined by your connection agreement. So 
your connection agreement can contain multiple MPANs, um, and it will be the combined consumption of the MPANs in your connection agreement that will determine which band you're allocated to, um, or the, the sum of your capacities. So when it comes to the whether a site can change bands, so customers will, will be allocated to the same band and they will exist in that band from implementation in April 2022 all the way until April 2026. So that's for the duration of the transmission price control. To change bands prior to April 2026, um, there are a number of criteria that, that, um, that can determine if you can change bands. The main one being that a site consumption must change, or site consumption or capacity rather, um, must change by at least 50% to be able to change bands. So if you just reduce your capacity by, say, 10%, that wouldn't be enough uh, to drive you into a lower band, even if your capacity drops below the band threshold. It would take a significant reduction uh, to do so. So the next bands, or the bands for the period April 26 onwards, will be calculated in after April 2024. So again, as with the current bands here, 24 months of data will be used to determine which band a customer will be put into. So the time period used to determine this will be between April 2022 and April 2024. So there's there's not much that can be done in, in the short term to move bands, but there's certainly something to think about in the near future if you were considering doing anything with your banding in the future. Uh, but we'll come on to that a bit later on. So I'm going to hand you over now to Grant, who's going to take you through some examples and the impact of uh, the TCR on various charges. Okay, now, thanks for that. So I'll take you through some of how these charges will impact you. Uh, the element we've got here is the transmission element. This is currently a forecast and will not firm up till January 22 which doesn't give a lot of time between a forecast and an actual for the 1st of April. These are our forecasts that will not be too far away. Worth noting that you've got the domestic side, and that's what their share of transmission is. You then have low voltage, non-half hourly. Again, their share of the transmission element. We'll show the distribution in a second. Then you've got the low voltage half hourly, so the first time you've got a customer with half hourly metering that then lets us understand exactly what they use per half hour. Thus, they have got these bands at KVA rather than an annual kilowatt hours. We'll then come on to the HV half hourly, which step up in the voltage. Again, some of the bandings, different steps from 1,000, for example, to 1,800, so higher usage. Then you'll come on to the EHV bands. Again, here's the transmission, but these ones here are site specifics. So the DNO element associated with these charges is published in the DNO statements. And those of you, if you need extra information, please contact the help numbers at the end of the presentation and we can help you with those. So take you on to some example DNOs and what the prices are going to look like. The numbers up the top here, you'd be able to link to your MPAN. You'll see in your bills that identifies the area. So these are Manweb, Midlands, Northeast and Northwest Electricity Board is the legacy names that have been given. So you can see the impact. So transmission for domestic depends where they're based, will then pick up this additional distribution element as well. And then if we come down to the LV, non-half hourly again, you'll see the individual bands with their associated distribution depends where they're located. I'm going to spend more focus on the areas that I think will be reflected for most of the customers on this call today, which is the LV half hourly and the HV half hourly. So we'll come on to show you what the impacts of those that are and the changes of bands. But you can see the steps are quite large going from band to band and also there can be quite a variation from DNO to DNO. As Niall explained, how the percentiles are calculated determines these splits across the nation, but then the individual DNOs have those splits and apportionments. So if we come on to show the impacts of being in the wrong bands, so if we take first the LV half hourly, and I'm showing the same bands flicked over here to show the examples. So if you were an LV H 
half hour only metered and you were in a band above 232 and you thought you were wrong and should be somewhere between 151 and 231, this will be the impact on your bands depending on these DNOs. So, for example, band four in ManWeb would have you paying 7042 for your transmission, 8194 for your distribution. If you were to drop to the lower band, you would save yourself 8385 a year, and that's from April 22 all through the way to April 26. So that can be a lot of money for your business. And the similar happens in the other bands stepping down. If you're in the wrong band, you can see the financial impacts of your business. The impacts get less and less as the band as you go further down. But there's a bigger impact when we come to the HV side of half hour limited, where you can see, so of a pick on man web again, you can see the transmission element would be 87,000 if you're in the top band versus 33,913 in the band down. Then if we look at the distribution impact, it's 78,522 versus 41,788. And that would mean if you were in the wrong band or you move into a site in the wrong band or you have a wrong connection agreement versus what you use on site, that could be up to £90,000 a year. And you, again, you do that from April 20 through to April 26. That's a huge impact on your business P&L. And it becomes even worse than some other DNO areas. If you look at Midlands, and the, these are large impacts on the business P&L. So that is getting on for over half a million potentially over those four years. So it's something you need to be mindful of. But if I take on some live examples of why don't jump from a band just yet until you've carried out some analysis. So I've got an example here, customer who is actually in the ManWeb area, this customer is. He currently has a 3,000 kilovolt connection. So he's in this top band. He's currently using 1979 to snow, but he's actually disposing of one of his buildings and we're working with him with the submetering to forecast he'll actually be down at 1450. So that will give us grounds when he changes that size to appeal that and he will then be able to save £90,000 a year. And that's clear for him. He knows what he's doing with his site, moving it forward with disposal. But if I come on to another example, so again, we have an 11 kilovolt customer. He's currently got 22,000 connection capacity and he's using 1,600. So he would be primed to think, next time the band comes around, I need to make sure I've adjusted my connection capacity. But this business has got to consider the future and he's actually looking at a distribution delivery vehicles that he needs to have rapid chargers fitted for these vehicles. Now they will range from 50 kilowatts to 350. And that will mean he will need this extra capacity so he cannot give it up and he can't gain the advantage of dropping a band because he'll then hold back his business from moving on to EV vehicles and actually been dictated by some of his customers to make him go on a low carbon journey. So again, you need to be careful before you jump because if this customer was to give up that connection capacity, he may not get it back in the future. Now, come on to another example. Again, 11 kV, current connection is 2533. He is currently using 1933, but he's about to undertake an LED refurbishment. Now, we're reckoning he'll come in just below 1800, which would put him to the band below. But going back to what I mentioned earlier, the bandings will be recut again for a 1st of April 26. He, with, along with our help, will make sure he goes well below that 1800 band. But even then, there is no guarantee he wouldn't still find himself in the top band of all other consumers do the same. So then picking low voltage, half hourly, so I've got someone who's on 275 versus the top of 232. He currently uses 212, so that would be prime to move him into the lower band and make sure he's ready for the next time round. And he's got a quandary here because he's doing and putting an LED that will bring this further down, but he also has EV to bring in. And the net effect is he's probably still going to be above the 232. So he will not be able to give that up or he'll hold back his business again. So 
while looking at your connection agreement and recognising what the future holds for you and your requirements, you must be mindful if you give that up, you may not get it back, but also as more and more pressures coming on to reduce emissions and reduce your carbon, there's a number of other factors that we recommend you take into account when you're looking at your connection capacity. So key points we've called out before, you may not get that connection that capacity back in the future if you give it up. So be very mindful that it's a long term decision. With that in mind, look at your low carbon journey. You are quite likely if you have parking at your offices or staff need to park and charge, you may need EV charge in the future, which will put up your demand. There will be a drive to move from gas to electric heating. So you can find your gas boiler being replaced with an electric heat pump. That again will increase your usage. Solar will help. That will bring down your demand, but only in daylight hours. So come winter, it may not help your peak demand. LED lighting is definitely something to look at that will help bring down. And going forward, we're starting to see hydrogen generation appearing locally at small areas. But again, that's developing not quite ready. Technologies that are there right now that can help you load shift and manage that connection agreement are batteries. Your own load management, as we've talked about with creation of triads and how they've been managed with some customers, a lot of customers do load manage well already, so they could be well placed to help manage some of that. And other parts we don't know that are coming yet is the technology improvements. So as everything moves forward, technology drives items forward, we will see other technologies coming forward that could be heavy on the electric use to come off gas and it's just a future you can't tell. So I would suggest that you call in our help before you make that decision to change your connection capacity so we can help you understand the plus and minus implications of jumping one way or another because you may regret it. At least make sure you have thought it through carefully. I'll bring you back to Niall to sort of summarise what has been being discussed earlier. Thanks, Grant. So, just in summary then, uh, the targeted charging view is going to be implemented from April 2022. Um, so this is going to mean increases to fixed charges um, and reduction to um, the current triad and just time of use charges you currently face. So, under this proposal, the triad avoidance and load shifting, um, the value of that reduces significantly. Um, it means that some of the lower consumption, higher capacity sites can be most affected, um, as they all see quite large fixed charges introduced. Um, and even some sites will move to only have a fixed charge, so there won't be any uh, triad charge at all. When we look at the dual side, like you say, your unit rates will decrease um, with the residual charge being moved out of them. Um, some sites will, will even see their, their green time of use charge zero or very close to zero. Um, so again, all the all sites will see their, their fixed charges increase as a result of this. Um, what you'll see is that some sites near the edges of bands for these fixed charges can, can be the, the most affected. Um, because there's obviously quite a large step change as you go from one band to the next. Um, so there will be some instances where people closest to the, the boundaries of bands will be, be most affected. So that is the, um, the, the summary of what's happening with the TCR. Um, I believe we have time for some questions. The first question we have here is, uh, what will the impact be on generation and demand once large consumers lose the incentive to try and manage? Uh, Grant, do you want to take this one? Yeah, thanks now. I'll take that one. There has been cold snaps that have meant power prices have spiked over a short term and National Grid have had to call on emergency reserves to keep the system balanced. So we'd expect something similar in the future, but exactly what it will look like in the future is hard to predict when the first non-triad season is almost two winters away. But National Grid will and have procured balancing services that should keep us balanced, but we'll need to wait and see what the future actually holds when it happens. So the next question we have then is, 
What other ways can businesses who have invested in assets to support on-site flexibility generate a return on this investment post April 2022? Um, that's probably another one for you, Grant. Okay. No, thanks, Niall. I agree. Uh, yes, it's a, a difficult one. Obviously, you've had your equipment to help manage your triads. So, as Niall's explained in the previous slides, there will still be some peak elements that will help you. But also, as we've said, National Grid and the distribution network operators will also be looking for balancing services. So there may be other revenue streams available to you that were not used before uh, when you're using it to try and avoid. So you may be able to sell your services outside your own business. The next question we have then is, uh, how do I figure out if my business has been allocated to the right Chinuos slash Juos banding? And how easy is it to appeal if this is too high? So I'll take this one then. Um, so towards the tail end of 2020, the distribution networks um, sent to all suppliers a list of um, sites that registered to us and the banding that each of those sites had been allocated to. So to find out um, which band you've been allocated to and check it's right, the best thing to do is contact your account manager or if you um, contact us at the email address on the, on the final slide, which I'll flip to in a minute. Um, we'll be able to help you find um, the, the band you've been allocated to by the DNO. Um, when it comes to the appeal, if uh, if you think you've been put in the in the wrong band, the appeals and the dispute process is handled by the, the distribution network operator. Um, so we can help you in um, finding out who the best person to contact at the DNO is um, to submit a, a an appeal. Um, but yeah, so if you let us know, we'll obviously be able to help out, but it is through the, the DNO um, how you appeal um, if you think you're in the wrong band. So I think we've got time for one more. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we've got one here. Um, as future energy requirements change, how easy will it be to secure more capacity for my business? Um, I think it's one that follows up on a point um, you made earlier, Grant. Do you want to uh, pick up the um, capacity? Is that now? Yeah, difficult one. Obviously, the process will be the same going forward. We'll need to contact the DNO as you do just now and ask for that upgrade. But a number of things to be mindful of. There could be a lot of demand as we go forward with an increase in demand in the network, for example, electric vehicles, gas moving to electricity uses. So the sooner you start those requests, the better. There is an expectation through the real type elements, as Niall highlighted earlier, there will be future investments required to upgrade our infrastructure, exactly how and when, and if that will meet your own requirements. It's too difficult to say other than start your requests for capacity early and plan early and have a contingency. Thanks, Grant. So that concludes the content for today's webinar. Uh, we'll be sending you an email shortly, which will include all the webinar material and our contact details. Um, there has been some questions we haven't got around to answering today, um, but for those, we'll give you a response via email as soon as we can. If you have any further questions or you'd like us to provide a personalised view of how these changes could impact you, please contact your account manager or get in touch with the email we'll provide. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day.